this key session at OSCE Security Days 2013 on uh, building a common future. It follows on directly from the session before, and we're looking ahead. My name is Rick Thompson. I was the international news editor for the BBC for a few years, and now I'm the director of T-Media, which does training and development work in broadcasting around Europe. Um, in a world that is globalizing at a dizzying speed, with a communications revolution, economic meltdown in the West, violent insurrection in the Middle East, and growing economic power in the Far East, for the next 90 minutes, we are going to look into the crystal ball. What are the main transnational threats now in a globalized world? Do we understand them? And when we've depressed ourselves thoroughly and decided we didn't really want to have children, we'll discuss the priorities for positive action and what a regional security organization like the OSE can do to protect citizens in the future. To help us understand the nature of the new global threats, we have a fantastic panel of top experts. Let me introduce them. On my immediate right, from Serbia, Sonja Stojanovic is the director of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, an independent think tank with detailed knowledge of the Western Balkans, a region which still has ethnic and religious tensions long after the bloodbath of the 1990s. Sonia has an MA with distinction in politics and security from University College London, and she has wide experience working as a consultant and trainer for the UNDP, the OSCE, and the DCAF, that's the Swiss-based democratic control of armed forces. Uh, and on my left uh, is Ang Angela May. Angela is uh, head of the statistics and survey section of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, here based here in Vienna. She has a PhD in statistics from the University of Padua in her native Italy, and has more than 18 years of experience at the United Nations in the Statistics Division and the Commission for Europe, as well as the UNOCD, where her team produces a host of authoritative information about drugs, crime, population, gender, disability, and migration, to mention just a few. On my far left is from Britain, Des Brown, Lord Brown, uh, since 2010, a member of the upper chamber of the uh, House of Lords at Westminster in London. He's a lawyer from Scotland, which seems to be considering leaving the UK for reasons I don't quite understand. Des Brown was the British uh, government secretary of state for defense in the Tony Blair government, combining the role with secretary of state for Scotland, and before that, he was a minister for Northern Ireland and a minister for immigration. He's been a tireless campaigner against the global expansion of nuclear weapons. And on my far right, from Kiev in the Ukraine, Viktor Konstantinov is associate pre professor at the Taras Shevchenko University in the Department of International Relations and Foreign Affairs. He's an expert in regional security issues, and he has studied in the United States and Canada and has held his present position in Kiev for 15 years. So please welcome our panel. And I also want to welcome the people who are watching us live online at the moment, wherever you are. I hope you find it interesting, and we welcome all tweets and comments. Um, I'll ask a few opening questions uh, of our panelists, but this is going to be a genuine debate. So I really do want people to say, uh, offer up their ideas about what they think the future threats are going to be. And just to encourage you, I'm, I'm going to give you a little digest. This is uh, Rick's top 10 of global uh, issues. So it may not be definitive, but I want you to think, uh, think about your children or your grandchildren if you've got them. Imagine the little baby born in the hospital in Vienna today which may well, he or she may well grow to be 87 years old and see the 22nd century arrive, unless he or she gets a beast. And um, so what are the main threats to this, these generations? What is the biggest threat to these generations? Here's my top 10, have a think about it, and then later on, I'll ask you to put your hands up. 
to say which you think is the biggest threat. Is it war and armed conflict? Is it drugs and organized crime? Is it terrorism? Is it political corruption? Is it a big brother state? You know what I mean by that? Orwell's vision of no independent media, total state surveillance, a failure of democracy. Is it economic collapse? That's the scenario that says, save lots of tins of food and buy a gun. Is it climate change? Because bearing in mind that uh, the experts seem to agree now that there will be more disruptive weather events, but it will lead to food shortages, water shortages, and mass migrations. Cyber attack. In fact, the whole cyber world, is that the thing that you worry about most for your children? This is social bullying or, in fact, more corporate attack than that. The idea that there are now organizations that can shut down main systems of government. Is it the energy crisis or shall we finally go for a new plague, viruses or escaped chemicals? So I'll ask you later which you think is the most serious threat to the younger generations. Okay, let's get going. I'm gonna turn to Sonia first. I mean, we've heard already this morning about macro ideas. You work in, in Serbia, in the Southeast region on practical issues. I wondered if you can tell us uh, what your view is of the threats facing the people you deal with in Serbia. Okay, um, first point I wanted to make is that this panel starts with the assumption that there are some objective threats. And you listed a number of those that are frequently found in discourse. And my experience working as a policy analyst is that depending on who you ask, you get different questions. And I'm going to give an example from a public opinion polls we did in, on Serbian public. If you ask citizens what they're afraid of uh, for their personal safety and security, you would find out, for example, in Serbia, that great majority of citizens feel very safe, 70 and 80% above. Belgrade citizens see, uh, feel much safer than citizens of London. Paris or Berlin uh, in a sense of their personal safety. But when you ask them who do they trust for their personal safety, none of the state providing institutions come to the first uh, spots. It's police that comes with 20%. Uh, that is the first, and if for some reason or the other, we have military being beloved institution. It comes with uh, four or five percent of protecting our personal safety. Uh, I'm making this point just to say that when you ask citizens about their personal safety, they feel safe. They're mostly concerned with economic issues, uh, with economic security, uh, and with the well-being of their children. But Within this group, of course, you have a differences between women and men, but uh, that's similar to all the regions. But if you ask them about national security, this is where we get uh, maybe the agreements on the discourse that has been discussed here, but uh, disagreement with our neighbors on the source of these threats. So, for example, two years ago, we did a survey asking questions on the threats to national security, and we used um, frequently mentioned threats in media. Uh, so it was a closed uh, option uh, question. And a uh, threat of separatism came quite high with a 20% something um, uh, in a public opinion poll. But when we repeated the question next year with an no options offered, separatism got below 1%. So people do not think of separatism like that uh, by, you know, wake up and think of separatism. It's just when this when is offered. Separatism. When you mean separatism, do you mean um, different communities being uh, separate? It means uh, state territory uh, falling apart because parts of our uh, citizens of our state do not want to, be, uh, to live together. But what I want to say is that this is also misused by state officials. So for example, in our region you have organized crime being perceived as one of the top threats. Uh, and everybody agrees on it. Uh, but when you ask different state officials, they would give different ethnic label to the organized crime. So for example, state officials from my country would frequently talk about Albanian organized crime networks. And on the other hand, colleagues in Kosovo, I was in Pristina just a month ago, the major concern was with B 
big, powerful Serbian organized crime in north of Kosovo. So it is uh, this divisive vision of threats that perpetuates the cycle of threats. And then I just want to highlight, because we are in OSCE, then we come to fora like this, where the threats are perceived as objective, and there is a limited number of threats. And I was just reading reports on transnational threats of the OSCE from the uh, last two years. And if you would look at these reports, you would think that the major threat in our region is terrorism. Uh, because most of activities done and most of resources invested were in regards to terrorism. So we do not live in one world of threats. We live in a politically divisive perception of uh, threats. And if I would uh, uh, just conclude, in my opinion from a number of surveys we are doing, I think one of the biggest threats uh, that has been discussing also here yesterday is breaking of trust but not that much, that, that much anymore at the level of interstate trust, but between all kinds of elites, state elites, uh, business elites, think tanks, so intellectual elites and citizens. So uh, breaking this bond within the state and community, I think is something that we all have in common, both in the West and Southeast or whatever you wanna call it. Thank you very much, Sonia. That's extremely interesting. I mean, looking ahead to the OSCE and, and one of the purposes of this gathering is for them to get advice about which direction they could pursue in the future. I mean, lo local differences have to be addressed. Obviously, you could argue that the OSCE can be uh, too centralized, not light enough on its feet. So it, it'd be quite interesting that uh, that's one of the issues we might talk about. Um, you mentioned uh, organized crime. Uh, obviously, I've worked in Serbia a lot in recent years, and of course I understand that people have no trust in the institutions. They say they are corrupt, and media is incredibly important in trying to expose that. Um, organized crime is a really big issue uh, involving drugs. Um, Angela May is uh, probably one of the best experts in the world in organized crime. If she turns to the dark side, she'd be a fantastic godfather, or should I say godmother. Um, looking ahead, what do you think are the, are the main um, uh, trends in, in uh, the areas that you and your team study? Thank you. Yeah, in terms of uh, uh, having, uh, you know, if I wanted to make money, I always say we are in the right business, but the wrong side. Um, so, what, in order to, for you, you know, to have a uh, uh, an idea of a global uh, threats in, ter in terms of uh, transnational organized crime. I want to show you a map. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, okay, you don't have to read it, but I'll, I'll drive you, you know, through. You will see the red uh, is uh, uh, heroin trafficking. So you will see the major starting from Afghanistan, but also Myanmar, uh, and then uh, how it reached Europe and other regions. The green uh, is cocaine uh, uh, that typically start, uh, uh, you know, as you all know, is produced in the Indian region uh, and then uh, goes uh, uh, to different directions, uh, reaching uh, the OEC uh, region. Then uh, the uh, purple one is uh, human trafficking. Um, then uh, the uh, these are the major that uh, I would like to, to you know, talk about. Then uh, we have also timber, uh, we have uh, counterfeited goods uh, that you see from Asia coming toward Europe. Um, and uh, so, but where I would like to focus, uh, because uh, you know, the purpose is just to say, okay, what is the threat coming from uh, the global transnational organized crime uh, to the OEC region? And I would like to point uh, to free. Uh, type of threats. One uh, is definitely uh, related to the uh, neighboring Afghanistan. Uh, as you know, in 2014, NATO uh, will leave Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, for um, those of us that work uh, very um, prominently in Afghanistan uh, to deal with uh, the uh, drug production uh, and trafficking, uh, uh, is really a worrying time because uh, of uh, particularly uncertainty. What will, what will it happen when NATO leaves Af Afghanistan? And particularly in relation to drug trafficking, but not only. 
uh, drug trafficking, probably arm trafficking, uh, and uh, all kind of insecurity that may arise uh, around Afghanistan. And in that respect, uh, the Central Asian countries uh, are really definitely vulnerable to this threat. Um, none of us can, you know, has the magic uh, touch to say what will happen. Uh, but this is something that in terms of conflict prevention, prevention uh, and particularly, you know, looking if we have to talk about the OEC work, this is an issue that uh, should be really taken seriously in consideration, uh, uh, particularly in relation to the Central Asia. We have indication, for example, already now that uh, the cultivation of opium uh, this year may increase. We don't have yet uh, um, quantitative data, but the qualitative assessment that we have done uh, shows that uh, it's still increasing from a very high level. And uh, so what does it mean this in terms uh, of uh, uh, neighboring countries? It means probably increased drug trafficking, but also increased instability because, uh, you know, uh, drugs brings money, money can buy weapons, and then uh, a sort of other action that may affect uh, the region. The other one that I wanted to emphasize is uh, the Balkan region, and that, as Sonia was mentioning before, you know, the threat of organized crime. Here you see that, uh, um, you know, it has been traditional uh, trafficking of heroin from Afghanistan. I mean, the traditional route from Afghanistan to reach Europe has been Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, Balkan route, and uh, to uh, Europe. What we see more recently is that there is an increase even trafficking of cocaine. And so organized groups that were specialized in heroin before, nowadays, uh, you know, they trade both heroin and cocaine, uh, again, enlarging their activities, their, their, their profits, uh, and um, particularly increasingly from Brazil on the other side of the ocean, maybe less of interest of OECE, but really Brazil is also increasing as a trafficking uh, country. And uh, apparently there are uh, um, Balkan, uh, you know, people that uh, particularly maybe after or during the Balkan wars move uh, to South America and to other places and now they serve as link uh, to the Balkans organized crime groups uh, to deal with uh, all of this trafficking of uh, different type of drugs. And uh, the last one that I want to mention, as you can see, all the arrows point uh, to West Europe uh, because that's how organized crime make the money. And uh, that's where, you know, we see all convergence uh, of all that kind of illicit uh, trafficking of different goods from drugs, from counterfeited, from uh, um, human beings uh, being uh, on uh, human trafficking or smuggle of migrants, uh, really all converging to Europe. And here I just want to... Uh, again, in order to be brief and say, uh, to make another point that uh, these are the goods. So these are the things that we easily see or easily or we, that we may see in the street. But there is uh, the flow of uh, uh, money where, again, if we talk about threat, that is something that, uh, you know, often the Western uh, Europe feel uh, untouched by kind of... Uh, um, conflicts uh, or type of uh, an insecurity relating to the traditional type of crimes, okay? But where is very vulnerable, and this shows uh, um, where, where Europe is particularly vulnerable, is in the illicit uh, financial flows. Because as you can see here, really it's, that's where the money converges. And here I wanted to give you another example just to make... Yes, and then uh, that's my last point. Uh, this is, uh, the, um, y y this is the price of heroin, uh, how it goes from uh, Afghanistan uh, to Turkey, and then it goes uh, Europe wholesale and Europe retail. Uh, and I want to show you to, to, to give you an impression and to understand uh, who makes money out uh, and of uh, the illicit traffic and where is the money made. And as you can see here, really the, the money is made uh, in the if you want consumers market. So that uh, in that particular, in this particular case, in, in Europe. So where, if I see the future of the threat and where also to focus uh, on uh, security is also to look at this in, uh, financial flows. Uh, um, because that's where the in, uh, organized crime can uh, affect the healthy systems uh, that uh, uh, we have, uh, that may have long-term 
thank you very much. It's, it's startling, isn't it? We have this alternative global society going on. Um, just briefly, I mean, reading your, your 2012 drug report, um, it must be a little bit disheartening for you to see the situation not getting better, but getting worse. Yesterday we heard from neighborhood countries, North Africa, uh, and people neighboring Afghanistan saying uh, it's perceptibly getting worse. So later on, maybe we can think about what should the OSC be doing if this isn't particularly working? Uh, now, should we be concentrating more on the social aspect where education becomes key and uh, you try to, uh, to make sure that people don't fall into this area? I'd like to turn to Des Brown now. We're very privileged to have him with us. Uh, a, a real expert on the, the big issue of uh, threats of weapons of mass destruction, among other things. It's very timely. Um, he and his colleagues, uh, he's a co-author of this interesting um, proposition, which has just been published. And it, it proposes the idea of building a new uh, security forum, which is a mechanism for getting the major players to, uh, to agree uh, large steps forward for mutual advantage. Um, looking ahead to the coming years, uh, Des, what, what do you think are the big threats facing us in this territory? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rick, for that too large introduction. I don't really want to be introduced as an expert on anything. I have a degree of knowledge, but expertise, I think, is for others to judge. Um, can I, first of all, uh, just thank the OSC and the Secretary General for inviting me to contribute to this uh, panel um, and to be here. And I should say that in seven years as a minister in the United Kingdom government, I was never at an OSC meeting once. Um, I don't know what that says about me or the OSC, and I draw no conclusions from that, but I just make that as an observation. I'm pleased to be here. This is one of my favorite cities. If anybody's listening, I'm always looking for opportunities to come back to Vienna. Um, the, the, uh, the second point I want to make is, uh, well, I want to make two Scottish points. I mean, one, I want to kill the possibility that I will spend the rest of this time answering questions about potential Scottish independence by saying that my view unequivocally is that the people of Scotland will vote to stay in the United Kingdom. I'm not complacent about it, but I think they will. All of my life, they have been 70, 30 percent in favor of staying, and the polling suggests that that's still the same. If anything, it's slightly increasing. So um, if that, that will maybe put some people's minds at rest or worry them, depending on uh, their perspective. But my second Scottish point relates to your words of introduction in which you introduced me as a graduate of Law of Glasgow University. I am not the only uh, graduate of law of the Glasgow University who has been in the news over the last wee while. Um, the the uh, president-elect of Iran, President-elect uh, Rouhani, is a graduate of a Glasgow University in law. It's caused a number of my friends who know me some deep concern about where Iran's going to end up. Um, but um, there certainly is interesting speculation about the Scottish National Party's attitude towards nuclear weapons, um, Iran's perceived ambition to have nuclear weapons and what this may mean for the future of, uh, of these uh, um, important talks. But um, for those of you who don't know that, that's a pub quiz question for the future um, uh, uh, for you. Um, you. You asked me um, in, in inviting me to take part to speak to my perception of the threats that exist in the area where I have some knowledge. And as I am more than full time now, the convener of the European Leadership Network for Multilateral Nuclear Disarmament, Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Security, I, I, I intend to come into this discussion through that particular spectrum. That may be counterintuitive to a discussion in the OSCE given that uh, arms control in relation to nuclear weapons and the control of nuclear weapons is out with the scope of the OSCE, although not totally. Um, but, um, but, uh, but that's the way I want to come in for a particular reason. But before I do, if I may, I just want to make one comment on the two contributions that we've already heard. I mean, I live partly in Scotland and partly in London because I'm a member of the House of Lords. 
I enjoy immensely living in London. I think it's a, a terrific city, and I'm sure that almost everybody in this room who's any experience of it knows that. Um, I have no idea whether the people of Belgrade think they're safer than the people of London do, but I can tell you the people of London think they're pretty safe. Um, the people of London, you know, live in a city where the final manifestation of almost all of those threats that you enum uh, 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 enumerated and those trafficking flows that uh, you um, described uh, in, in, in that very interesting diagram, where a lot of that ends up. I mean, there is no question. Um, you know, we have the manifestations of all of that, including this deeply polluting effect of um, tainted money in our uh, uh, commercial and financial system, which is corrupting it very badly. But it is all there. But it doesn't make the people of the city feel any less secure. In fact, I would venture to suggest, as I go about this city and have done consistently for the last 15 years, that despite what can happen in the city of London, the people of London feel more secure year by year and believe that they enjoy a significant level of security. Now, that's got to do with their ability to be resilient in difficult circumstances, and it's got to do with the level of policing that's present and lots of other things, but mostly it's got to do with the way in which they themselves lead their lives. It's got to do with their confidence in each other, and it's got to do with the fact that this city, in, in a large part, is a very young place, um, it's got a lot of young, ambitious people from all over the world who want to live their lives in a particular way that's very tolerant and very open to other people. And they don't depend on structures of security to provide their sense of security, they depend on relationships. And it's very obvious, and I can see this you know, as, I, as I move around different parts of the city, including areas where some people would not want to be late at night, but where I feel very comfortable. Um, but let me just turn to the, for a few minutes, just to the threats as I perceive them in the area where I have some uh, knowledge. I mean, in, in relation to nuclear weapons and nuclear materials, the fundamental threat we, we, we face is a threat of complacency. We, we have in this world, depending how you count them, about a third of the nuclear weapons that there were at the time of the Reykjavik summit, which I think was in 1986. Um, we have variously, depending how you count it, seen the United States, for example, reduce by warheads to the tune of 85% since the end of the Cold War in our own country, 75%. You know, we are, now, we are now living in a world which has significantly fewer nuclear weapons than there were at the end of the Cold War. However, we still have, for some inexplicable reason, um, large stockpiles of those weapons, particularly in the Euro-Atlantic area, which are at minute's notice to fire. I mean, this is what President Obama himself described as the most dangerous relic of the Cold War. Although we have fewer nuclear weapons in the world, they are in more countries, and some of those countries are the most unstable countries that you could imagine, but certainly in the most unstable regions. And it is com utter complacency to believe that in those circumstances, we will be able to maintain the balance that was maintained in a bipolar world with, la with significantly larger numbers of nuclear weapons in a multipolar world where there are multiple perceptions of threats and unpredictable responses. And many people who have studied these challenges over the last 10 years or so have come to the conclusion and most of these people are people like me who have had experience of having responsibility for nuclear weapons, that unless we do something about this, the inevitability is that by accident or by design because of misjudgment of circumstances or deliberately because people perceive that this is the way to respond, these weapons will be used. There is a, an, an inexorable inevitability about this if we are not careful. Now, I could go into other uh, uh, factors that suggest why I think that we will find these weapons or ma their materials being used, and some of them have to do with the ambition on non-state actors and terrorists to get their hands on these materials, and the fact that we have substantial amounts of these materials in parts of the world where they are less secure than they should be, and that you know brings us into 1540 and uh, the challenges that we face in that regard and the capacity of some of these countries to be able 
to deal with these issues and where the OSC and others lie in their responsibility to build that capacity, and that's maybe something we want to discuss. But we know what we need to do. Uh, you know, I mean, Senator Nunn, Henry Kissinger, Bill Perry, um, I've forgotten, George Schultz, uh, told us many years ago that we needed to reduce the saliency of these weapons and consequently their numbers if we were to control them. We needed to improve our ability to build non-proliferation regimes that were sustainable. We needed to improve nuclear material security. We know what we need to do. President Obama, when he was elected, made a speech in similar vein in Prague. Four years ago now, he was cheered to the echo. And almost every one of our countries is led by somebody who, if he's not a member of Global Zero, at least buys into the idea of a world free of nuclear weapons. Despite the fact that we know what we need to do, the nuclear armed states in the world plan to spend $1 trillion in the next 20 years modernizing or developing new nuclear weapon systems. Now, from our perspective in the area that we have responsibility for in this Euro-Atlantic zone, the reason why that is the case is because our security is frozen in a Cold War paradigm. We repeatedly do what served us in the 20th century, and we do this for a number of reasons. One of them is that nuclear burden sharing in relation to nuclear weapons across NATO is an easy way to give a perception that you have a strategic view of security rather than building the strategic security that is necessary to face. We here in the Euro-Atlantic area hold 90% of the world's stock of nuclear weapons. Of the 14 countries in the world that have nuclear weapons in them, nine of them are in this region. Whose responsibility is it to take the leadership in this area? Leadership again, a key word. Um, let's uh, let's turn to our fourth guest speaker, um, uh, Victor. You've uh, you've got a probably a different perspective on this uh, from Kiev. When you're looking ahead to the global threats that have to be addressed, uh, where do you stand? Well, actually, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, this whole discussion is one of the most meaningful uh, that I've witnessed in all my life. And that make me also uh, think about um, a little shift uh, in my own presentation. I'd like to reflect first not from regional perspective, but on regional perspective itself uh, in context of uh, OEC activities. And that exactly uh, where I can try to answer your question. Uh, when we are talking about transnational threats, uh, they are more than clear. It's long since they've been marginal. Now they are in the center of every discussion on security issues. But uh, those um, transnational threats are easy to define, easy to name them. Uh, and it's very hard uh, to find out how to fight those threats, how to assess them in uh, each and every uh, particular case. Uh, in Europe, we see almost the same thing. When most of transnational issues uh, are facing uh, not regional perspectives, but regional fragmentation. Uh, usually, uh, those transnational threats for particular countries start as cross-border threats. Uh, they are tightly connected to their neighbors. Uh, sometimes, those neighbors could be sources of threats. Uh, that is the case of different conflicts both frozen, protracted, active, no matter. Uh, sometimes uh, they are uh, transit countries, like in a uh, case of uh, cross-border crime or uh, drug trafficking. Uh, and sometimes those states uh, just see the same threats differently. And the last important thing, uh, no state face um, one single transnational threat. It's always about uh, a set of threats. And those uh, sets are completely different. That means that in OSCE, we have as many sets of uh, transnational threats as we have participating countries. Moreover, sometimes we have some subsets within a particular country, uh, depending on uh, party, uh, political parties, on um, national minorities, on subnational entities, and so on. 
and that is a uh, quite big problem uh, for OSCE because this is an uh, international organization looking for some cohesive policy, looking for something uh, that unites. And in case of transnational threats, first of all, we see something that divides uh, those participating states. Second thing, uh, connected to um, this overlapping of different international organizations in Europe, and first of all, overlapping of activities by OEC and European Union. In case of Eastern Europe, that is uh, particularly important. I think that uh, Balkans are the same case. Uh, for European Union is integration uh, system. Transnational threats are almost as important as for uh, individual countries. They also goes directly to uh, internal politics. They also goes to uh, voting process. So that is so important uh, we can put them uh, bef uh, before uh, some international issues sometimes. And that is why European Union is working uh, very actively uh, addressing transnational threats in neighboring countries. And uh, from the other hand, for neighboring countries, some transnational threats um, became um, the points of agenda uh, in um, integration to European Union, in uh, association with the European Union. Sometimes these countries, like for example Ukraine, uh, they are dealing with transnational threats in very narrow perspective, uh, just to fit uh, some requirements from European Union. For example, when we are talking about uh, visa lifting, for many countries, the issue of um, human trafficking, the issue of cross-border uh, crime, first of all, is an obstacle on this way to lift visa uh, from European Union. And that means that uh, not the threat itself will be addressed but uh, this uh, political um, demand from European Union will become uh, the forefront of uh, threat perception. And uh, that is why I suppose that um, to address transnational threats that are fragmented first on regional level and then on essential level uh, as the threats themselves, uh, for OEC it's important not to made a slight adjustments to its means, but maybe uh, to change and critically change uh, the whole scope of its policy. Yes, it's gone green. Um, the overlap uh, issue is uh, quite interesting. I mean, there is a political reality. There is a political cycle. The OSCE can produce continuity. But uh, the EU does have an agenda, you say, which is uh, basically an enlargement agenda. The OSCE, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have an enlargement agenda. I mean, do you have a problem with the fact that both of these organizations are operating in Serbia? No. Simply said, no. Uh, but first, I must be honest and say that I used to work for the OSC mission to Serbia in law enforcement department. And I strongly, from a personal experience, would say that the OSC played a crucial role in many regards that any of the int other international organizations have not covered. Primarily, the OSC has been the main um, actor, of, so to say, in the phase of stabilization and it has played a key role in stabilization in the south of Serbia in facilitating dialogue between the central authorities in Belgrade and the local Albanian political leaders, uh, integrating Albanian population into our police force and so on. Second, by the fact that there has been a presence, a permanent presence, despite all the failures of international organizations, you still had some institutional continuity, which you frequently do not have with EU, which is very important for a country that goes through dramatic changes and in the course of 10 years has witnessed, you know, being a champion of changes, our prime minister being assassinated by parts of our security forces, to going back, uh, so to say, on a right track. So a lot of changes in security domain uh, related to the issues of democratization that really require understanding of a context. And third, and the last thing, 
is that EU somehow does not care about what I see in many of the OSC documents being referred to as soft aspects of security. And OSC was the only one, and it's still the only one, who actually is, uh, has been dealing with community policing, accountability, not just in the sense of fighting corruption, but generally accountability, good old standards of you know, good policing in line with human rights. So in that sense, I think the roles are complementary. What I do mind is when political discussions in OSC come to for forefront, and from what I've heard from our MPs, for example, when the discussions on border management are in parliamentary assembly of OSCE, there is a forbidden word of Schengen. Any reference to EU standards is like swearing. And this is, I think, uh, wrong. As a colleague said, to those of us exposed to the influence of both organizations, I don't see why wouldn't OSC use some of the models developed in other organizations and test it in its area of uh, uh, influence. And here, if I may give a few of uh, things where I where I see uh, OSC already having a fruitful ground that can build on. Uh, first, I think the Strategic Police Matters Unit work on uh, developing standards on democratic policing and sharing the standards in this great variety of countries that is gathered around OSC is very valuable. And I think it could be built on by uh, some of the tools that, for example, EU is using, like regular threat assessments. And it's necessary for these threat assessments, like, his, uh, like organized crime threat assessment, for, for example, to be public. Because in this way, you involve not only state uh, actors, bureaucracies in discussion, but you actually provide the space for other actors from civil society, media, and so on to follow these trends. The other tool that I would recommend is state-to-state uh, -state peer reviews. Because in many of the cases uh, that we are discussing now, actually the problem is located with the, with the state. It's not the, uh, just the civil society out there organized in organized crime. Many times it has been sponsored by the state authorities. So uh, how are you going to tackle that in a diplomatic way, if not at least allowing for peer reviews uh, and you know, discussing these findings and in that way putting pressure on these countries? So to sum up, I think OSC can use models developed in other uh, organizations uh, and can contribute to testing it in a greater variety of cases and should not shy away from other models and from what it's going, uh, doing well, and this is uh, also soft aspects of security provision. Okay, so uh, if you want to join this discussion now, I very much hope there will be people who've got something to say. Uh, we've got three microphones lurking here, and uh, uh, Nono and Dimitri and uh, Roman will leap towards you if you put your hand up, and uh, then we'll try and get uh, several comments in first. Uh, the gentleman there with the red tie was first. Please uh, don't wait. Put your hands up if you want to contribute. S can you tell us who you are, please, before you speak? Uh, Marcin Terlikowski. I'm from the Polish Institute of International Affairs, which is a uh, Warsaw-based think tank. Uh, well, I have a comment, more a question, but the question is related to a comment. I mean, just to hear from the panelists what they, what they think about the issue. Basically, discussing the transnational and uh, non-military threats, we very often touch the uh, issue of cyber security and cyber crime. And uh, it's been um, repeated also here in the OSC forums that, that maybe this is not the best organization because th there are so many strings attached to cyber security because it's very technical, because uh, it's been also militarized in the sense that uh, the armies are developing their cyber, cyber defensive and also um, everyone knows cyber offensive uh, capabilities, but at the same time, uh, looking at the core problem in combating cyber cyber threats, which is a lack of communication between states, lack of uh, the briefings on the uh, detected threats, on the on the trends and uh, the kind of soft malware which is which is uh, circulating in the in the website. Well, if the lack of communication and lack of uh, trans uh, lack of rules, uh, in including the co involving the cooperation uh, of uh, state agencies uh, responsible for protecting uh, infra uh, cyber infrastructures, 
uh, is a main problem, then what better organization than OSCE? We have 50 plus uh, countries, uh, which kind of, uh, which could, I imagine, agree on um, a set of uh, even non-binding, just political rules to allow their re uh, respective uh, cybersecurity civilian or po police agencies to basically meet, re meet regularly and talk about at least the trends, at least what they detect in the cyberspace. Uh, it is, of course, the job for engineers, but it is the job of politicians about uh, and the decision makers to create conditions for them to talk. So I would just like to hear your, your views on that. Thank you. That's an extremely interesting subject. It's been touched on during the conference a couple of times before, but we've never really got into it. Um, I, I've only recently been looking at documents and articles about cybercrime, and I really didn't understand it. Um, but the, the Lithuanians are the experts, I think. Ermas Reinsalu uh, is Estonian, uh, Estonia, not Lithuania, Estonia's defense minister. And he wrote recently about the, the so-called Internet of Things. He's not the first to do that. It's a, it apparently, it's a quite a well-known concept. The Internet of Things uh, seems to be a description of a, of, of a future world where the computer reigns supreme in many ways. So your home is computerized. Your work is computerized. The essential systems of electricity and gas and and water are already semi-computerized, and uh, the, this is a, a vision of a world that is coming. And there's a lot of research and activity going on to develop uh, computer-driven systems. But of course, it means that society will be more vulnerable to cybercrime. It is 13 years since we all held our breath about the millennium bug. Were aeroplanes going to fall out of the sky? Was the power going to go out across all the major cities? Well, it didn't happen. But in the past 13 years, uh, those systems have developed fantastically. And uh, Ermas Reinsalu from Estonia uh, said, uh, the increasing ease with which cyber attacks can be launched and he talks about a 600 euro device called a botnet, which can power up uh, a lot of uh, uh, activity on a, on a system and make it break down. Uh, the, easy, the ease in which the cyber attacks can be launched means we must prepare now for more numerous and more complex cyber attacks in the future. And he advocates education. He advocates it being uh, much more at the center of, uh, of political discussion. I mean, I, I don't know whether there are any cyber specialists here. If there are, please contribute. But uh, Des Brown, what, what is your, uh, your, your feeling about uh, this, this new world where um, the, the computer systems run everything and that we are much more vulnerable to attack? Despite the fact that I'm a member of the House of Lords, I do use computers, but that I don't hold myself out. I don't hold myself out to be uh, an expert in relation to this. But I was in the last panel. I think I think Jim Collins said that um, we had to consider, and in, in, in a passage of his contribution when he was talking about change and the challenges of change, and whether we were equipped for the challenges of change. I mean, two things occurred to me. One was that we haven't shown ourselves very well equipped to be able to deal with the challenges of the immediate past, never mind the challenges of the future, and we're still working our way through some of them. Um, but, but he went on to say that we need to look at this environment beyond the issue of just threats. We need to look at it in a much more holistic fashion. And, and my only contribution to this discussion um, is to, first of all, express surprise that an institution like the OSCE is not already having detailed discussions about the nature of cyberspace and the, in, in that context, the challenges that uh, the, the, the institution was set up to engage with. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain almost every manifestation of uh, crime and threat that we live with in the 21st century operates to some extent through this space. Um, and, and, and I certainly know, you know, from what I know of uh, the terrorist threat that we live with in the United Kingdom, that the cyberspace is very important to communication and we have a challenge in our domestic environment about the degree to which we can police that environment and have knowledge of what's going on in it and whether we can 
uh, store or request that people store metadata for the purposes of being able to subsequently investigate crime. I mean, these are the kind of challenges that are playing out in all of our media because of because of what has been revealed about um, the the operations of uh, of the United States and Prism and others. And 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 I I mean I add to this kind of general discussion. I have just concluded debating. Um, a reform of our defamation laws in the United Kingdom, a large part of which related to how you can police or restrict the publication of information on the internet by the interdiction of court proceedings in order to protect people's reputations. And the reason that I come at this in this fashion is that this, this debate has a whole other set of players who value this unregulated space, who would protect it, I mean, I mean in the case of Julian Assange, to the, you know, the risk of his own personal liberty and his future, there are some very strongly libertarian views shared not just by people who make money in this environment, but, but, the, but people that believe this reg, unregulated space is very important to the way in which they lead their lives and to their ability to be able to communicate and to make their own personal choices. And I, from my own experience in government and the challenges that we face daily in government in the United Kingdom and sometimes are visited upon us by decisions that other countries make in relation to what they do here, suggest to me that the solution to this does not just lie in the hands of sovereign governments, even if they come together in institutions. You know, this developed network is owned now by lots of people who have substantial commercial interests and by others who have substantial investments in it in the way in which they lead their life and are very powerful in their ability to be able to advocate for continued independence in that area. This is a much more complicated discussion than the ability of 50 plus or even all of the countries of the world to decide somehow that they were going to try and regulate if that was possible, which I don't think it is. Uh, but I still think they would face a challenge from outside and forces from outside that would open up and, and use that space in a way that they did not want and would wish to regulate but couldn't. Yes, it, it's a scary world, isn't it? I can remember a time when there wasn't even a personal computer, and now we're talking about um, the ability of uh, people to leak and uh, put information out there, which may be embarrassing for governments that want to keep it secret. We're talking about uh, the home level, where you know, what are my kids able to watch on my computer? So the, this whole unregulated world is an extremely interesting one, and I very much hope that it may rise up the OSCE's agenda in the future. Victor, you wanted to uh, say something on this subject. Yes, that exactly goes to the classical type of uh, transnational threat, uh, the one that affects not only states, but uh, individuals. And while states can protect themselves, they do that on national level. They have NATO and other organizations to fight uh, cybercrime, to fight cyber, cyber attacks. For individuals, uh, that danger is no less important than physical uh, violence, than violation of basic human rights. I guess that is exactly the place where uh, OEC can step in, uh, in terms of human security. And it was pointed out here in uh, discussions, yesterday discussions, that for many um, activists, political activists all over Europe, for many uh, non-governmental organizations, umbrella of uh, OEC could be a powerful stimulus to, uh, to act. And that is also um, a possible way to act in, in terms of uh, human security, to unite those efforts uh, from civil society, from uh, international non-governmental organizations, from national uh, non-governmental organizations. Thank you very much. And the Secretary General is right here in the front row and he's listening extremely attentively. But that's a very interesting suggestion. Um, I, I want to do raise your hands if you want to raise another subject. Through the miracle of cyberspace, uh, we are getting questions from people who are watching and listening. Um, there are two about drugs. Let me just, uh, Des Brown, there's one says from, from Salim Sazak, who says, Lord Brown, 
what role do you envisage for the OSCE to facilitate arms reduction talks uh, in the Middle East? Uh, and um, obviously, this, this refers to the fact that is this uh, a proper role for the OSCE? What do you think it should be? wasn't arguing that the OSCE should have a role in arms reduction talks. I was suggesting, you know, on the basis of this agenda, which follows on from the easy uh, conclusions seamlessly, that there is a role for the OSCE in the Euro-Atlantic space for providing an opportunity for sustained dialogue military to military, senior official to senior official on a range of challenging issues from space all the way through to cyber threats Des against a set of achievable challenges which have been set out there in an agenda, a timed agenda, by a credible group of people, all of whom have significant personal history in this area and all of whom believe this is achievable there is a role for the OSCE to facilitate part of that discussion in order to build the necessary political capital for political leaders to mandate more challenging discussions of this nature with a view to releasing us from the straitjacket of 20th century, a 20th century paradigm of security to a 21st century one where we can release significant resources from defending ourselves against each other when there is no possibility of us being at war with each other in order to use those resources to meet the challenges of the threats that are real to the way in which we live that come from outside of that area. That's the point I was making. As far as the, the Middle East is concerned, I mean, I make two points about the Middle East. You know, I, I, mean, I mean, hands up anybody who thinks that what the Middle East needs now at this time are more nuclear weapons. You know, I mean, it already has too many, in my view, in any event. But who wants to live in a world where there are two nuclear powers in the Middle East where there is no communication between the two of them? None at all. No communication between the two of them. Now, I mean, we have a responsibility, and those of us who have nuclear weapons have, in the context of the world's orders, a particular responsibility to live up to our commitments in this area, to try to ensure that that does not happen, but that we facilitate the environment in which we can move as far away from that possibility as possible. And we have failed to deliver on our commitment to have a conference on weapons of mass, or weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East by the timetable that we set ourselves, and it was our suggestion. We proposed that. We got unanimity for it and we failed to deliver it. Now, I'm not suggesting that any particular country was to blame here, but we failed. So we, we have a responsibility individually and collectively as members of the NPT to have delivered that. And my answer to the question is, I don't have a particular role for the OSCE in the Middle East, but the individual member states of the OSCE, insofar as they are members of the NPT, have a responsibility in that area that they fail to live up to. And that is a failure that collectively we own. Okay, uh, Angela, you wanted to just add a word on that? Not on that. N not on that. Let me just uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we have a couple of questions directed at you. A question to Ms. May from Valina Chakarova, and she wants to know what the statistics are on the spread of crystal meth in Europe. That should be fairly a, a brief answer, I guess. She's obviously worried about crystal meth. And, and El Yelchin Rafiev um, asked the more difficult question, what on earth do you do w uh, with the cultivation and export of hard narcotic drugs uh, in the conflict-afflicted territories, which are basically uncontrolled? I think you must be thinking about Afghanistan. That's a big question. What do you do about that? <laughs> okay, well, start me with it start with an uh, easy answer on methamphetamine, and uh, I think, uh, I don't remember the name, but definitely it should be 
um, worry about it uh, because indeed uh, uh, methamphetamine is spreading and is increasingly spreading all over the world, not just in Europe. Uh, but uh, it was particularly spread in Asia and so on, but uh, really in Europe is increasing, is also increasing in North America. So we see really that is an area because it's a drug that is uh, very, can be very easily manufactured. Uh, so that is, and can be manufactured everywhere. It's not like opium. You have to be in Afghanistan or in places where uh, the nature gives you the possibility to have it. Methamphetamine can be manufactured everywhere. Uh, do you think law enforcement agencies are are aware of the, the changing trends in drug use and drug manufacture? Uh, well, there are different degrees, uh, and uh, there is also an issue maybe of uh, the awareness, but also on the capacity to contract, uh, co to, uh, to deal with it. And then, of course, the, ca the, the capacity that countries have uh, is unequal. Some countries have a very strong capacity, others have a, a weak capacity. And uh, I want to go back uh, to a couple of issues, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, one uh, is when there was a discussion on whether the people in Sarajevo feel s more safe than in London, uh, and what is the city that is more, you know, perc as perceived uh, as more safe. And I think we don't have, uh, uh, we have to be very careful, uh, because uh, um, the perception of security does not mean that uh, there is lack of crime, or yeah, and uh, and I think that uh, what is more challenging here is that uh, the um, if you want uh, I don't know if to call it insecurity or uh, uh, crime that leads uh, to problems uh, or to affect people, uh, uh, we always tend to to focus uh, on what we see and what we can measure. The problem of organized crime, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, is that uh, now organized crime operates uh, in peace. So there is the famous pace mafiosa, that means, uh, you know, we operate uh, and then uh, we, you know, in, in silence, uh, we don't hit too much uh, in places where they can hit back, uh, so that, uh, you know, there is a silent uh, operation, uh, but meanwhile, uh, they are eroding, really, the institutions, and little by little, uh, uh, the institution, and even if uh, the single citizen doesn't see it on the street, uh, you know, he, ma, he or she may see it uh, in 20 years uh, when uh, the school of their children uh, will collapse uh, because it was not built properly. And uh, we have to see, for example, what, for example, is happening in Central America, where actually organized crime there, for a number of reasons, uh, that has to do mainly with the change uh, of flows. Uh, so the fact that they had uh, more or less drugs, for example. Uh, so fighting each other and fighting the government, uh, uh, where actually is operating uh, in uh, a very violent environment. So that if you ask the citizen uh, in Central America, they will tell you that their major threat is organized crime. While in Europe, uh, maybe you ask, uh, they don't talk about organized crime because they don't see it. But again, we don't have to uh, fall on the trap to think that this is not a problem. And uh, to conclude, I want to go back uh, uh, to the gentleman when I started the issue of cybercrime, and I think the question was, uh, you know, the, re the, the cooperation. And all transnational crime require a transnational response. So, uh, the, really, the response to that uh, is really the co regional and international cooperation, but real regional international cooperation because uh, often you know what we have uh, even even when uh, and i think even in oec uh, region uh, is that when we say okay we have to fight together this uh, crime or this uh, issue again uh, we have to be conscious that we are dealing with unequal capacities unequal visions probably uh, so uh, that doesn't have to prevent to have a regional cooperation, but uh, once we establish this cooperation, we have to establish uh, with the knowledge that we have to deal with this issue and not to try to avoid them. Uh, just for the sake of say, let's find an agreement, uh, and then we don't an agreement if we, to implement the agreement, we have really to solve uh, this uh, nitty gritty uh, issues. Yes. Yes, the, um, this thing about cyber, it's a cyber war going on out there now. And uh, I think that uh, the good guys with the white hats have got to make sure they have enough expertise at, at their fingertips uh, to be able to deal with things properly. 
Um, and I mentioned again, Estonia, because of its cyber attack in 2007, has become pretty expert. They have a cyber defense league of experts, uh, international experts, who are tracking trends and trying to make sure that uh, the good guys don't lose the race. Um, the gentleman here has been waiting patiently to, to ask a question. I did? Oh, can you think of another one? <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to just uh, contribute? Okay, thank you very much. Um, don't be afraid to lift your hands because any minute now I'm going to ask you to do exactly that and tell me which of Rick's top ten threats you think is the uh, most dangerous, so be ready. Um, I wanted to just raise, raise another little issue here. Um, the the it may be because I worked in journalism for a long time, and now I do quite a lot of, uh, of training work, in, particularly in, in Southeast Europe. Um, there's been a lot of talk about soft security, a lot of talk about trying to create uh, stable societies, democratic societies, where people feel that they know what's going on, they're not run by corrupt regimes, they have a voice uh, that um, they, the, the structures of the law are trustworthy, and so on. A stable democracy. And um, this is one of the essentials for uh, a program of um, conflict reduction. Because if you do have uh, people who live in, in societies like that, then the chance of conflict is reduced. And of course, education is very important. Uh, can I just introduce this subject? You mentioned it, Sonia, so maybe you can just explore it a little bit more that if the, the, there is a lot of work by OSCE regional offices to try to promote good journalism, try to promote independent journalism, particularly in television and radio, which is so influential. Uh, and in a lot of places, I'm afraid the situation is poor. All the latest surveys are saying in Europe, uh, there are more and more pressures on journalists, normally because of the financial crisis, and they fall into the trap of being funded by local authorities or funded by big business, and independence becomes impossible. So um, how important in this, in this kind of general picture of a more stable Europe do you think uh, the media is? And we have a whole number of journalists sitting here at the back, so if you've got anything to say, feel free. So the theory of change behind the OSCE. A uh, number of speakers have uh, said that its added value is uh, a possibility to convene all kinds of actors, not just state actors. And I think in history it used to be, but uh, no longer you actually see the overlaps of the different fora. Uh, we have a number of civil society and media representatives here, but there is not really a continuing dialogue, so to say, between the state uh, representatives and civil society and media. And my uh, argument would be in favor of addressing a number of these threats uh, as perceived by citizens by actually involving non-state actors such as journalists and civil society. And it has proven, at least in our part of the world, that investigative journalists were the one and only tool actually to bring to the light uh, the problem of organized crime, for example, showing this invisible hand of state behind the, um, the, the crime, uh, using public sources, using you know, hard data, policing methods, but with public sources and coming to the same results that probably our investigators had, but were not allowed to pull, pull out of the drawer because of the political reasons. So that's why I think that for the problems where actually the state is the source of a threat, it's very important to find other partners and for OIC to think of having parallel fora or fora of uh, communication between state and journalists or civil society. But just one more uh, point. Uh, we've discussed yesterday the social media and, you know, the engagement of citizens and so on. Um, journalists can play a very important role 
in uh, bringing things to the front, but they can also play a very deva divisive role, especially when it comes to a conflict. And those journalists that bring to the fore uh, uh, both the you know, problems created by the state, but also perspective of the other, are also uh, very often in the biggest danger of all actors in political process. So there should be also uh, a thought of how to ensure protection of these kind of activists like investigative journalism, uh, journalists or human rights defenders, for example. So, I mean, we are now looking ahead to the OSCE's priorities. Um, I, I obviously uh, hope that that remains one of them because I think it has huge impact if you have good journalism and is very damaging if you don't. Um, let's, let's, let's have our little vote now. Um, so are, you, are we ready? Uh, you're gonna put your hands up, definitely. It won't hurt. And um, so which is the, think of that little baby in the hospital. Their, their future is before them. And which is the biggest threat to the happiness of, uh, of this generation? So here we go, hands up if the biggest threat is war and armed conflict. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're getting a few votes in here, Des. Uh, second, is the biggest threat drugs and organized crime? Yeah, yeah, I, I did read them through before. I'm hoping people can remember that, that what's coming up, I'll tell you what's coming up. Terrorism, corruption, a big brother world, economic collapse, climate change, cyber attack, cyber problems, energy crisis, or a plague, viruses. So here we go, back to the top. Armed conflict again. We had a few, I think it was about six or seven, yes, eight, yeah. Okay, still, still a risk there, and I would have thought that's true. Drugs and organized crime, is that the biggest risk to the happiness of this little child? No, you can't, you've got to choose one. <laughs> The four, yes, there's three, three there for that one. I mean, just remember that if you're wrong, nobody will remember, and it doesn't <laughs> matter. Uh, okay, is terrorism the biggest threat to the happiness and of the future? You see, there's only a handful of hands. Political corruption. Well, we, we, we have quite a forest of hands over there. Okay, that's quite an interesting one. I think you may be just in the lead. How about the idea of mass surveillance? Big brother, no independent media, failure of democracy. We've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's probably equal first 10. I think the journalists are voting en bloc on that one. <laughs> okay, economic collapse. This is save tins of food and buy a gun. Economic collapse, which leads to social collapse. The Armageddon scenario. Who's been watching post-apocalypse films? This is well ahead now. You've got quite a lot of votes for that one. So this is the risk. Yes, all the economists. How about the biggest risk to the happiness of this child being climate change? Let me remind you, we're talking about not only flooding, but food shortages and mass movement of people is what they're predicting. Well, I think that's not in the lead. I think we've still got economic collapse. <laughs> Three more to go. Cyber attack. Is that going to be the biggest threat to our happiness in the future, the rest of this century? There's quite a few people who think that. Uh, energy crisis. You can add to that resource crisis, if you like. Energy and resource crisis. Energy crisis, people know it's there. You're not voting twice, are you? <laughs> There's about four votes there. And finally, are we all going to be afflicted by new plagues? We've heard we're going to die of bird flu, we're going to die of SARS, um, and people are making nasty things in laboratories. Is that the way that we all die? Not with a bang, but with a sigh. Anybody think vote for the virus being the biggest threat to our future? Well, there is two. Two people are worried about that one, but I can now declare that this forum thinks that the biggest danger to us is some kind of economic and social collapse. So um, to, to end this, this, this key looking forward session, we need to advise the OSCE. We've been asked to be a consultative body. What would you, and I'll ask each panelist in first, if you were advising the OSCE for its long-term future strategy uh, and we accept that there is a little bit of an identity crisis going on. Um, 
what would you recommend for it to be effective in the future to make uh, life secure for the people within its region? I'm going with you first, Victor. Uh, there was numerous remarks that governments, after all, are making decisions, not OEC. Uh, and maybe that is the point where I, I should start. Uh, actually, OEC was perf perfect in uh, monitoring and in assisting uh, in different cases, in uh, different situations, in crisis, in conflicts, in stabilization uh, operations. And uh, that is also a hint uh, where to start. I suppose that, first of all, OEC is uh, the only organization with uh, really all European reach up to Central Asia, which is also almost part of Europe. Uh, is an uh, organization that can help uh, not only states, but its societies in, in Europe. And the second thing is uh, that um, great and extensive record of cooperation with non-governmental organizations, uh, with um, individuals, with other international organizations, not only with states. All that uh, seems to be um, uh, the answer to your question. I suppose that OEC should do uh, much more in uh, uniting efforts of uh, non-governmental bodies uh, to advise, uh, to um, devise some sort of common language in security issues. We lack that language today. We speak uh, in different languages uh, in most cases. And that will be the biggest and the most important contribution of OEC in uh, years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and and Sonia, uh, let let's let's hear what you think the uh, the OEC should do. But I'm particularly interested in whether you think it's um, it's too centralised. I mean, I've spoken to people in in places like Serbia where. They say uh, Vienna is uh, is too controlling, and they don't trust the locals. Uh, do you think that's fair criticism, or is it just a general complaint? I think it's a general complaint against all international organizations, and I would strongly recommend the book by Sarajevo author Nenad Velichkovic called Sahib, uh, an excellent book on uh, IGOs functioning that I got by the. the uh, with the dedication of a friend saying, do not show it to a member of a family or a close acquaintance. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to complain about how international organizations function. Um, I strongly support what Victor said. Uh, and I believe that OSC could be an organization of uh, different engines or networks, so to say. Uh, so, to say. so any process in OSC can continue to have uh, this important space for dialogue among government, uh, government representatives, but can bring also other actors. And I think that could really change the quality of debates. Why wouldn't we have, for example, uh, a double track uh, process on confidence building and a first track process sponsored by OSC going in parallel uh, without prejudice or that one should influence the other, but just testing two ideas at the same time and providing space and safety for both actors to intervene in different ways. Um, moreover, I think OIC could be also an organization of different uh, architecture in a sense that we could have certain policy areas more developed in certain sub-regions of the OIC uh, and not shy away from a regional or sub-regional approaches um, and not just have this local Vienna response. Because of what I found, for example, working within the OIC, that uh, was very difficult to have joint projects between Bosnia and Serbia or Serbia and Croatia, just the regional uh, approaches or you know regions talking to each other. So that's another uh, proposition. And the third, the one I feel most passionate about in this security debate, and it's again in line with what colleagues said, is not to forget the human rights dimension. I was reading an ODEA report on transnational threats, and the sentence that stuck in my mind, uh, and that was kind of smuggled, you know, somewhere in the middle of the report, was that still in the OSCE area, security takes precedence over human rights. 
Uh, and I don't think it uh, applies just to one side of the members, but to all, you know, uh, parts of the transatlantic and transasian community. So to keep, you know, bringing human uh, dimension to the fore forefront of discussions on security and not shy away from using the models from other organizations. Okay, after all, we're trying to help real humans. Um, let's go to Angela. Um, in a word, yeah. uh, I mean, you, you're here in Vienna, you know a lot of these people. What, what would you say they should do differently? Well, okay, I, I leave aside as an institution as, uh, from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, the obvious uh, areas, uh, but where, by the way, we still, we already cooperate, we, we mention organized crime, corruption, terrorism, yeah. Where I think if I have to find something that, uh, you know, different uh, is that uh, um, to link more uh, with the development world. The, the, you know, the United Nations now is a crucial time uh, where it's defining uh, development again. I don't know how many of you heard about the Millennium Development Goals, but that was the agenda, has been the agenda of international community for development. And um, now the international community is thinking and say, what, uh, what has changed in 10 years? Uh, and what should be the new agenda? What we call the post-2015 agenda? They, expi they expire in 2015. There has yes, to be a, they expire and now there should be a new goals, new target. And uh, there has been uh, really signs that uh, one of the very few areas that uh, the new MDG should address is uh, precisely security. And so there is really a recognition of a strong link between security and development, both ways. Uh, you know, insecurity uh, undermine development uh, and low development uh, fuel insecurity. So, and uh, you know, even the high level panel chaired by uh, President Cameron uh, really highlighted as one of the area, peace and security, as really the area where to be addressed for development. So my advice to AC would be not to become a development agency, there are many. Uh, but I think to cooperate uh, in order to see how uh, security policies uh, needs to include more issues related to development. Uh, the, you know, the previous uh, panel uh, was uh, talking about uh, soft security areas. Uh, I, I, I would say to me they are the hard security because they are the hardest to address because they are the one uh, in the long term. And vice versa, how to work with the development agency or the development world to make sure that uh, in development policy, security is taken in consideration. If you allow me, I hate when people does not an do not answer the question, so I take the opportunity to answer the question on what to do with uh, Afghanistan. And then goes back to this issue that, uh, you know, we can address this uh, only in the long, uh, with a long-term perspective, putting together what we call the carrot and the stick. So, you know, the stick uh, is uh, the, if you want traditional law enforcement policies where to say, okay, we have to uh, really fight uh, and uh, violently sometimes also fight. But if we don't have the carrot, that doesn't work. Uh, and so, and the other way around. So in that sense, I would say, you know, to the OEC to, you know, have that perspective uh, that, uh, you know, to work to make sure that there is always this balance. Thank you very much. and. Uh Des Brown, uh, it's a difficult one in a couple of sentences, but uh, do you think the OSC is on the right track and should just keep on going ahead? Or do you think there's a little change in direction might be hel helpful in the coming years? I, mean, I, I, I think there is a distinctive role for the OSC from my observations of, uh, uh, of the organization, but not from my engagement with it, because as I've said before, I, I have very little engagement with the organization. But... I mean, in response to your question, I mean, I, I would like to adopt the priorities of my fellow panelists. I mean, I, I think uh, engaging in building civic civic society across the space is crucially important. Um, and you know, most politicians I know come from a background of engagement with civil society. Um, so it's kind of in our DNA. I, you know, I practiced human rights law before I became a a politician, a uh, full-time politician, and I have a, an affection for the rule of law and the role that it plays, and, and, and I, I agree entirely that we can't ever afford to take our eye off the necessity to respect human rights. Um, and and, and, and I, I, uh, I also, you know, not just because our Prime Minister leads this 
group who are looking at the post-2015 agenda for development goals, but because I think this makes enormous sense, um, you know, that, that most of those arrows emerge from places that we would genuinely call development areas that if they're less likely to come to what they're less likely to come towards as if there is no motivation. But but my final point is that it, you you said when, when people were putting their hand up for, you know, armed conflict that somehow I was getting support in here because of a previous job that I have. I mean, actually my argument is the opposite. I think that the the preponderance of views that the threats that we face and that the challenges that future generations will face do not come from the likelihood of armed conflict but come from a combination of other factors that this audience believes is where I come from. But yet, you know, we have a group of political leaders who continually make decisions that put the preponderance of our resources for dealing with threats in the basket of preparing for armed conflict because that's what they know in the past. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, I put my hand up for economics, uh, 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 an economic uh, uh, um, challenge for this reason that, you know, I lived through 2008 and to today and I see what, you know, uh, an economic crisis can do to the world and its resources and the opportunities of the babies who were born in that period. I see that, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand that an economic model which is inexorably based on growth is set on a collision course with nature. And we have to stop that collision from happening. You know, and, 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 and it will be reflected in all sorts of things. Climate change, it will be reflected in resource challenges, it will be reflected in crop failure, it will be reflected in a whole lot of things. And what we have at the moment is that we have resources being spent on hardware for a conflict that most people don't believe will ever happen. Um, we have in our international uh, internationally in our national strategies, security strategies, an identification of climate change and all these other consequences that there will be from this inexorable economic collision course that we're set on. But we have resilience measures for dealing with the consequences rather than investment to prevent it from happening. That's what we're planning to do. We're planning resilience to see if we can get through. You know, and, and if anything, the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons conference that the Norwegians hosted in March shows us that the current modeling that we have about the effect that we can have on the climate by our own actions suggests that our resilience will be a waste of time. There are none of us that have the capacity to be able to deal with the consequences of what we will do to this planet by the way we conduct our economics. A very, a very good summary, and as David Galbraith has just tweeted, all of these challenges are connected. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I would congratulate the OSCE on, on grappling with so many different challenges simultaneously. It's a terrific update. Um, thank you to the OSCE for organizing this session. Thank you for the staff here at the Hofburg Conference Center. I, I'd, I'd like to thank the audience for being here and to listening so attentively. I didn't see anybody asleep. And, um, and most of all, I want to thank our expert panelists, Sonia Stankovic, Des Brown, Angela May, Viktor Konstantinov. Uh, and uh, after lunch, session six is about the OSCE's 2020 vision. So that's at 2.30. From the panel and from me, goodbye. <laughs>